In 1893, we see uh, Gauguin uh, returning to Paris. He has a show at the Duran Ruel Gallery. This is uh, uh, the gallery. Duran Ruel is uh, the gallery that also showed a lot of Renoir's work as well, uh, many of the other Impressionists. He also has a weekly salon where he uh, invites people and he dresses up like the primitive uh, kind of person and, and that type of thing. But uh, underlying all of this in his time in Paris, things don't go very well. Uh, eventually he will uh, this is the, the final breakup that he has with his wife, and eventually uh, this is also the last showing he'll have with Duran Ruel. Uh, their, their relationship also breaks up. When we look at the art he's doing uh, from this time, we also have to mention him, uh, Anna the Javanese. Uh, this is also thought to be one of the reasons that he broke up with his wife uh, and, and part of his mystique of having this primitive nature in Salon and really showing himself as this primitive person. Uh, he dated this woman or at least had a relationship with this woman, Anna the Javanese, uh, half Javanese, half Indian, uh, who was uh, living in Paris at the time. And we see her in, in many of the works, obviously this one. Uh, uh, we can, we can see her here. Uh, and, and again, this is all kind of part of the personality he's trying to adopt while he's in Paris of this, you know, modern primitive type of person living uh, again in society. Uh, we have some wonderful photographs of him at the time. Uh, we look at the group on the right and we have on the left is Paul Gauguin and then uh, next to him is, is uh, the artist Mucha uh, from the uh, Art Nouveau movement and then another one of their friends and then on the far right, we actually do have uh, the image of Anna the Javanese herself uh, dressed up, I believe, uh, in, as if she was one of the people from Brittany. You can see that large white uh, a headdress she has on, very reminiscent of what she would find in Brittany. Uh, uh, at this time, uh, again, he, he's really kind of trying to project himself as this modern primitive, and, and that's kind of his angle uh, when it comes to art and all of these other things, and he continues to do work. Uh, it's kind of a mixture. A lot of these are, are the Tahitian subject matters, but he's executing them uh, in Paris. And, and I always find these works to be very uh, uh, complex in terms of the things that he's trying to, to work into uh, uh, the conversation. They're not, uh, you don't find those large open areas uh, like you do in his earlier paintings, the cloisonism effect. This has a lot of details to it, a lot of fine marks uh, that, that, again, when you look at Gauguin uh, in this previous period, this is kind of an evolution away from that or a movement away from that. Uh, and something we really do see a lot of when we look at his work uh, from this period here we have a self-portrait, uh, and we have in the image in the background the very famous painting uh, of, that he painted previously of his wife, uh, who he left behind uh, in Tahiti. Uh, but of course, the painting has has some importance to him. Uh, he left her behind, and it's always thought of that he never really had uh, a, a strong relationship with her. That he very much thought of her as as almost as a servant. But uh, you do see her in in some of the work that he was doing on in Paris at the time uh, she does reappear uh, if, if nothing else in this painting uh, but we do see other images of her as well so uh, at least she was a, a, in his mind somewhat as he continued his life here we have another self-portrait with idol and again kind of a, a, a the, the the same type of fictitious idol uh, that you would see before, uh, and this wonderful little watercolor on the right of, of him having, I think, one of these salons, and ironically, if, if nothing else, you can see that that same red and white outfit that we were talking about in the previous lecture, uh, he seems to have donned it in this picture uh, as he's painting away at an easel. Again, uh, uh, almost ironic that he's taking this piece of garment that uh, was given to the Polynesian people, and he's adopting it uh, and taking it back to to the country of origin, almost, if you will, uh, as a representation of these people that, that uh, he was supposedly living with. Tiha Mana, again, uh, as I mentioned, we, we do see her in several of the paintings executed in Paris uh, at this time. Tiha Mana has many parents, uh, uh, and again, we look in the background, we can see this faux idol or faux image of, of uh, what we would think of as uh, uh, what he would have thought to be, uh, uh, you know, this type of Polynesian type of statue. 
Uh, and, and we also notice on the top this very, very fine work that almost works uh, its way into some type of lettering or writing with its individual characters uh, and its lack of repetition. Uh, again, he's still using a lot of the subject matters that he was doing while he was there. And, and in my mind, he's very much trying to promote uh, this image through this work. Here we have kind of a return to the cloisonism uh, that we saw before, and, and you'll notice that we have the famous red uh, fabric one more time there. Uh, if we look at the ground, this wonderful patch of this peaches pink color uh, in contrast to the green and then working our way up to the blue, this is a little different than the landscapes he was executing there uh, in that we do have a person directly in the foreground uh, as opposed to many of the landscapes we looked at before where the people were isolated in the background uh, and we, he really didn't kind of stick these two images together. It was either very, very close or very, very far away with the people. Here it's a kind of a mixture. He also continues to work on his uh, memoirs or his ideas about paintings. Uh, the Noah Noah Suite uh, from uh, 1894, this is a woodcut uh, that's from this. And again, uh, this is a, a reminder that uh, Gauguin worked in many different medias. He, he worked in ceramics as much as he worked uh, in painting. And, and there was even points in his life when he supposedly gave up painting in favor of ceramics. Uh, on the right, we have this uh, faux idol that he created. And, and again, to my understanding, this actually uh, made its way into the Paris Salon at one point. Uh, there's a wonderful story behind that. You'll have to research for yourself. But he does work on this memoir. And then this is uh, something we see here again, one of the original manuscript pages and, and uh, one of the covers, if you will, uh, from this. This is his big description, if you will, of his time uh, in Tahiti along with his work and his art. And it has been uh, very much torn apart by modern critics, both for, for plagiarism and, and also for its exaggeration of ideas and, and that type of thing. And uh, if nothing else, we could view it as a historical artifact uh, of the time period that Gauguin was living and, and uh, his ideas towards what was going on and, and, and his ideas towards art. So uh, we, we shouldn't 100%, I think, roundly dismiss it, but we should take uh, Noah Noah with a, a bit of uh, a reserve. Day of the Gods from 1894, we have the wonderful idol in the background. And as we move forward, we see a, a beautiful pink beach and then uh, the, the wonderful organic packets that we so much associate with Gauguin uh, at full play in, in the foreground there. Uh, and again, this is uh, just a reminder, the bigger point about Gauguin is he is really one of the first artists to kind of make these larger abstract sensations in his painting rather than directly trying to mimic uh, what he's seeing in real life. Life, if you will, uh, one of the first people to kind of look away from the canvas uh, or look away from what he's looking at and look at his canvas and try to work things together. We also have images like this that are very distinctly uh, from Europe. Again, Christmas night, we see the snow uh, and, and two cows that were very much remind me of, of Marc Chagall uh, uh, in their faces. But again, very much a, a portrait that you would associate with his time in Europe. But it's almost as if he's taking uh, this Tahitian atmosphere of the people in particular and transforming them over uh, into this European landscape. But again, uh, this much snow, it would be very hard to find in any particular season and in Tahiti. Uh, this is very much a European type of landscape. Uh, and I mentioned this, he does kind of move in between the two subject matters uh, during his time in, in, in um, Europe, again, farm in Brittany, almost reverting back to uh, some of the art that he was doing before his time when he went to Tahiti, again, looking at the landscapes. And uh, perhaps in my mind, biographically, he's kind of searching for what he wants to do and, and, and this real ideology of what, what, what he should do next. Uh, uh, he spent this time in Tahiti and he returned to Paris. And uh, as I mentioned, things aren't going extremely well. He lost his relationship uh, with the dealer and, and, and art uh, um, gallery owner, Duran Ruel. Uh, this is the last time that he kind of has his final uh, schism with his wife. Uh, and, and, you know, they've been, of, of course, estranged for many years as well. So in June 1895, he returns to Tahiti uh, and he builds a house. And this is actually a photograph 
of his house, if you look very, very closely, you can see a statue uh, hanging within the framework. Uh, but it also should be noted that uh, it is thought biographically at this time, around 1896, uh, that, that he, had, he had, of course, contracted syphilis at an earlier part of his life, but this was the time period uh, that it was really becoming uh, a detriment to his health. Uh, as it says, in 1896, he developed leg sores from uh, commonly associated with syphilis, which would make it very difficult to be overly mobile. Uh, also, in 1897, he finds out uh, that his daughter, Aline, dies. Uh, and this was a very tragic for thing for him as well. He actually spends a good amount of time uh, when he first returns not painting and kind of immersing himself uh, in the local politics. But when he does return uh, to making art, what we find is, is uh, a much more complex complexity to the canvas. Again, when you look at the second Tahitian period uh, in connection to the first one, in my mind, uh, again, this return to Paris inserted this complexity into his work, and we don't find uh, those large patterns as much. And in, in an image like this, uh, again, if you look at the throng of people and uh, the ins and outs and all of the information he's really trying to dictate uh, in this one image, uh, again, here's another example with the king's wife. The simplicity of Tahiti uh, has somehow escaped him uh, again on his return. And we look at this and we see uh, things like the trees and the amount of complexity and him doing each individual leaf rather than uh, making that organic shape uh, with one solid tone that we so much associate with him. Uh, again, perhaps he's questioning uh, his own existence and what he wants to do with his art. I don't think that his return to Paris was uh, absolutely anything but a failure in his mind and, and, and of course his returning to Haiti uh, is a mark from that and, and here he finds himself here again uh, kind of questioning what he wants to do three Tahitian women from 1896 again uh, a measure of complexity in comparison uh, to the images we have seen before and we do note one more time that the use of that wonderful fabric, not just once but twice. Uh, but we also have the figure on the left wearing this white kind of peeking into the composition as well.